from the library and welcome to the Fritz Scott Coffee Talk. Many of you are here for the very first time. I really hope that you enjoy it. And I'd also like to make the first announcement that um, we also have to give regard to the Papia. So by a show of hands, does everyone who is here know that they, they will have pictures taken? Do you give me consent? Do you give us consent? All right, there'll be pictures taken throughout the session. Um, some will be used on social media. So I'm just giving you a heads up so that you don't think that we stole your pictures and just placed them there without your permission. All right, um, for those of you who do not know what the Coffee Talk is about, I'm just gonna give you like a brief history, then we'll jump into it quickly. So the Coffee Talk basically is about spreading awareness on different medical topics. And we usually have a guest that joins us, uh, a guest who, is who specializes in that field and at the end of the session you've given an opportunity to ask questions so as the conversation progresses please write your questions down so that you don't forget anything um, please don't be nervous this is a very free space a very open space I know most of you are students here we also have some researchers in the audience we've got staff members who do different things on campus but I'd also like you to spread the word so that next time you can bring someone to the coffee talk because we're going to have a lot of different topics throughout this entire year. Alright, now that I've spoken so much, I feel like I've spoken so, so much, I'd like to introduce my guest, Dr. Kruente uh, Janse van Fielen, who, is, who specializes in infectious diseases and internal medicine. He works at the 3 mil, 3 military hospital here in Bloemfontein at the Tempe. At Tempe. Do, does anyone here know where Tempe is? Yes. yes, you do your students most. So I know you guys sometimes pass there all the time. So he works there. And today we'll be talking about vaccination awareness in Africa. Uh, how many of you have received vaccines before by a show of hands? Hmm, quite an interesting number. Very good. How many of you think you're knowledgeable about this, about vaccines? Okay, so you're knowledgeable about it. Okay, he's here to dispel some myths that you might or might not have heard before. Um, but yeah, at the end of the session, like I said, you're going to be given an opportunity to ask questions, think as critically as you can, and ask whatever it is that you feel you need to ask. All right, Dr. Flinter, good morning. Well, afternoon, brother. Um, thank you so much for joining us at our coffee talk. Um, we're so excited to have you as our guest today. And... Um, with this conversation on vaccination awareness, I'd like us to start off with infants and children in particular. Now, why is it so important that children get vaccinated? And if you can also, please highlight the different diseases that vaccination um, protect them from. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I never thought that I would be at an event where I bribe people to come and listen to me. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I suppose it's very like a political rally. I mean, if there's food and t-shirts, then people come. If there's no food and t-shirts, there's no one. I think the, the whole issue about vaccines is, as far as I'm concerned, it's the most cost-effective health intervention available. But the problem with it is, because it's around, we're not aware, people are not aware of it, of it anymore. If you look in, in, in older medical history books, they had polio outbreaks. So there was a polio outbreak in the late 1960s, 70s, which is actually started off the old ICU uh, care facility. And what happened is they had so many children paralyzed and they could intubate by then, but they didn't have any mechanical ventilators. So they had medical students sitting in the medical wards with antibags ventilating these children. And then they developed these iron lungs, and it was a massive problem. I don't know who of you have seen a case of COVID. I don't know anybody who visited me. My mother-in-law, who died at the age of 93 last year, actually had uh, paralysis due to pain. But pain is not the disease that we see. And I think that is one of the big problems, is 
the devastation caused by all these childhood illnesses uh, has been completely removed from society with a very cheap, very effective, very safe intervention. Uh, and because we're not constantly confronted by that, people now think, well, they've got all this nonsense about um, uh, vaccines. And I think the, the, the wake-up call that we got is what happens if you do not have a, a vaccine? We saw with the COVID epidemic. Um, so some of you might know that um, the hall at the nurses' home was converted into a kind of a field hospital intensive care unit during the COVID epidemic. We had 48 beds in, the, in, in that ward, in that ICU. The vast majority of the patients that ended up in there were ventilated. Uh, and the death rate in that uh, unit of ours, 48% of patients who was admitted died in the of COVID-19. Because we did not have a vaccine. Then the vaccine came along and everything disappeared, and we don't see it anymore. But all the nonsense about vaccines is still around here. So I think, I think that as a background, um, since you, the discussion here, when do you think the first vaccine was administered? I think probably in the 1960s, 70s. The correct, Maybe answer, the correct answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Edward Jenner, is credited for the guy who is he's kind of the father of immunology. Um, and he started with small pack, spot vaccines. Uh, you might know the story where he took, uh, uh, there was a mold made with cowpox, uh, and they realized that cowpox is not as serious as uh, smallpox, but it gives you immunity. So he's, uh, the, the maid worked in his house, his son who was eight years old, so he took some of the pus from the milk maid, inoculated on the child's hands, um, and then uh, subsequently exposed him to smallpox. I, mean, uh, I don't think I would like to be involved in that experiment, but the child, nothing happened to the child. Um, and so he's, that, that's kind of the, the fable story. The truth is that for millennia in China and in Turkey, they knew that if you take scabs of patients with uh, smallpox and you inoculate people with that, some get serious ill, some might even die, but those who survived, uh, they were immune against uh, smallpox. So what Jenner did was he just, he was the first person to write a medical article and publish it in a journal, and therefore he is credited to it. But I mean, that's something that happened for millennia before that, and there were a huge number of other doctors uh, vaccinating uh, people with cowpox to protect them from smallpox. So for the medical students here, you first, no matter who discovered to do something, if you're the first one to write it up, you get the credit. So make sure you write the things up. But in any case, um, the same happened to Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur is credited with the first person to vaccinate the child against rabies and then the, the child survived. But there was a huge number of other people that did exactly the same. This is the one who published it and got read it. More recently, uh, RSV is uh, a viral infection that leads to hospitalization of a huge number of children every, every year. A huge number of a big morbidity and some mortality. And recently, they've introduced the vaccine against RSV and suddenly that disappeared. Uh, vaccines for cancer. When I was a medical uh, officer, and I see the head of obstetrics just left, but uh, we saw a lot of patients with um, cervix cancer. And since they started with the HPV vaccination campaign, in Europe, cervix cancer has disappeared. You don't see it anymore because of the vaccine. So there's huge benefits in these vaccines. So the childhood vaccinations that we do, um, you know, interestingly enough, I uh, looked at French history, and the, the French kings, they had a policy of not having a relationship with their young children. Because the chances of those children surviving past the age of 10 years were very slim. 
So what they did, they would have the children, but they would have a nursery where the staff would look after the children. And only once they survived past the age of, I think it's about 10 years, then they would say, well, this child might survive into adulthood, and they would start building a relationship with the child. But we don't do that anymore, because our children survive childhood, because of the vaccines that we have. So I think um, that for me is the, the most important thing um, down there. Um, cost effectiveness, the vaccines are actually very cheap, but uh, Prevanar, the once again pneumonia that all the children also get, the previous tender price was in the region of 800 rand per dose per child. That's very expensive. The Department of Health did a financial analysis and said even at that cost, the number of hospitalizations and deaths you prevent is cost effective and it's worthwhile giving that vaccine. The new tender price for that same vaccine, it's a generic equivalent, is going to be 96 rand, significantly cheaper. But even at that, at least the, the measles vaccine, I mean, it's a rand or two rand per dose. It is the most cost effective medical intervention at the moment available that had the biggest impact on human survival, in my opinion. Sure, thank you so much for that, Dr. Quinter. And as you were speaking about um, the different uh, sicknesses, well, illnesses that children get from not being vaccinated, it then, it then brought me to this question that how many vaccines then does children get? Because I know it's quite a number. I have got no idea. <laughs> it's I've got no idea. I'm an adult physician, so there's a huge number of uh, pediatric vaccines, but yeah. All right. And then if smallpox then has been eradicated, why then have other diseases not been met? Yeah, so the smallpox thing is, is very interesting. That's the only disease that's been completely removed from the face of the earth, apart from there's one laboratory in the United States and one laboratory in Russia that keeps samples of small packets in it. This is a, so you know it's been eradicated, but in the military, you join the military, you get still vaccinated against smallpox because there is always this fear that it will someday be used as a biological warfare agent. So all military personnel across the world is still vaccinated against it. But in any case, having said that, there is a number of things that criteria that you need to fulfill to be able to eradicate. Okay, first of all, you need to have a very effective vaccine. But secondly, you need a disease that's not that easily transmissible, which smallpox is. You need something that, if you look at the patient, you can make the diagnosis. So, if you remember COVID, I mean, somebody presents with COVID, it can be flu, it can be a common cold, it can be COVID, it can be any of these respiratory infections. With smallpox, if you look at the patient, you know what the disease is immediately. There's no doubt about it. So it makes it very easy to identify the case, and then you can identify all the contacts and vaccinate them. So you've got the, the disease that's not easily transmissible, but easily recognized, an effective vaccine, you identify everybody, and you ring fence with vaccination. Um, and then um, there must not be an animal reservoir. I mean, obviously, if you have like Congo fever or Ebola, I mean, it spills over from animals to humans constantly, so then it's difficult. But you have to have that criteria. So the second disease that they thought they could eradicate with vaccination was polio. And they came very close to it. The problem with polio is that it caused a very mild infection in a lot of children. So if you have one case of polio paralysis, it usually implies that there's at least a hundred other children that were infected that just developed a mild disease. The second thing is um, that there is a vaccine that's easily administered. It's just an oral uh, drops that you swallow. The problem with polio is there's an area in northern Nigeria, um, a Muslim area of Nigeria, and then in the on the border between Pakistan and um, Afghanistan, there are people that refuse to be vaccinated. It's against the culture, against their religion, and all the outbreaks that we have of polio in the world at the moment, you can trace back to that. So if they 
get a case of polio and Angola, and they look at the genetics of it, they can say, oh, it originated in northern Nigeria, or it's the case in Mozambique is from Pakistan, it's somebody that travels from there. Um, and nowadays, with all the wars and upheaval that we have around the world, um, it's difficult to maintain the vaccination status of everybody, and it seems that polio has slipped out of this possibility of being eradicated. But smallpox fulfilled all the, the, the criteria and made it easy. Everything else is a bit more difficult. And uh, with, the, with the distrust that people have in different governments, I think it's not easily going to happen again that people will be able to eradicate it with the vaccine. So as you guys are hearing, there are many interventions that are still being done um, behind the scenes in the world of science. But I also want to ask, HIV also still exists. Why hasn't there been a vaccine for it? Yeah, um, for Dr. Swanepoel and my colleagues at the back, I think they could still remember um, Professor Van Merwe. I think it was 1987 um, when HIV came to the forefront and it was uh, President Bush, the older Bush in the United States, had a news conference. Uh, and they said, we've got the NIH here, uh, within two years we're going to have a cure and we'll have a vaccine for HIV. So that is now, what, 30, 40 years ago. Um, I have a friend that often visit and he actually works on this. And every time I meet him, he says, uh, in the next 10 years we'll have it. That was about 30 years ago. If you ask him, he said, in the next 10 years. It's always 10 years ahead. And then with the COVID outbreak, um, we had a... a we were supposed to, Dr. Van Mar Mar it was in that year of COVID that we were supposed to have our reunion, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the doctors in town was our class leader, so he created a WhatsApp group for all of us. And we were on that group, and then COVID came, and we had to postpone our reunion. But on that group, people discussed it. And the one thing was, these idiots, um, they tell us they're going to make a vaccine for COVID, but they can't even make one for HIV, so it's a big conspiracy, um, the whole thing. And I think that, first of all, shows me that doctors are not knowledgeable about everything. You're knowledgeable about your subject. Other things you should rather keep quiet about. But, so, to the ex actual issue here, is that all viruses are not the same. So if we start off with measles. The measles virus is constant. The, the measles virus in 1950 and 1980 and the one circulating now, the antibody that you need against it looks exactly the same. So you can use the same vaccination and it will work very well. The polio is the same. If you then look at something like influenza, influenza, the virus changes every year, but we know what to target. So they see what's circulating in the north, northern hemisphere, they predict what will cause flu illnesses in the southern hemisphere, and they just make the vaccine. Um, on that note, for instance, this is a, a side for the flu virus, uh, flu influenza that everybody's scared about now, they monitor it. And every time there's a, a bird flu outbreak, they take the virus, they, they design a vaccine for that, and they keep it. So the idea is the moment they get widespread transmission amongst humans, they will know exactly what the virus looks like, and they will just manufacture the vaccine and protect everybody. But, so that's the plan. Now the problem with HIV is the antibody that neutralizes the HIV sits in a very protected pocket. So it's very difficult to access that pocket. Secondly, that area where that antibody binds changes very quickly. So that by the time your body is made the antibody, that antigen is changed and it doesn't work anymore. So that's why we have patients with very high viral loads, anti-test antibodies, and you show that they've got HIV. But that antibody does not protect it because one, it cannot reach, and the virus just evolved. So it's a completely different virus and makes it very difficult to make a vaccine. Um, which most people is, think is not going to happen in the foreseeable future. But I think the point here is viruses 
coronaviruses, they're each a different species, and some of them have got properties that make it easy to create a vaccine, and others you simply cannot do. And it also sounds like some of them evolve, because I heard you say with the influenza, every year it changes, which was for me a bit scary, because then, how does that even happen? So, so it's just as the virus replicates, the, there's changes in the genetic makeup of the virus, and sometimes these viruses are the same virus, there's two different viruses infecting a person. It exchanges genetic material, and then it changes a little bit. Uh, but it's, that's called genetic drug. So every year it's a little bit different, so the flu that you had this year will give you some protection next year, but not complete protection. If you get an epigenic shift where there's a complete change in virus, then you have an epidemic like the um, Spanish flu that they had in 1920 and outbreaks that we had later on. So, yeah, but that's genetic change in the makeup of the virus. And then we're now going to move on to a very critical one um, COVID 19. I know that really wrecked a lot of people's lives. But there have been many conspiracy theories around it, and one of the, the problems that people saw, well not problems as such, but um, I think it's something that made people a little unsure of whether the, of whether the vaccine is, is actually as effective or not, is the fact that it was, it was created in such a short time. So I think people have questions around that, and why was it? that it was created in such a short time. I mean, I know we're under pressure, doctors are probably under pressure, scientists were under pressure, but that short, I mean, it was, I think, in less than two years even. Yeah. Um, and, and then, if it's a short, that they actually check the safety of it. Yeah. And that, that was the big issue. Mm. And again, I think that's, that's if you don't know the backstory to it. So you can actually say they started developing RNA vaccines in the 1960s. Because in the 1960s is when they discovered RNA. The problem with RNA, the half-life of RNA is so short that you can't really use it for anything. In the 1990s, the scientists who discovered if you, if you change the building blocks of the RNA a little bit, it can last just slightly longer and you can actually then use it for something. And then they said, well, this is actually a very novel way of making vaccines can't be really developed. And so you might, some of you might remember, there was the, this, the first SARS outbreak was in 2002. So that first SARS outbreak was not as transmissible as this one. Uh, it started in Hong Kong and it spread around the world, killed a number of people, but quickly died down. With that, they decided they need a vaccine. And they, the first thing is that they discovered that if you can make an antibody against the spike protein, you can neutralize the virus. So then they worked on that. And then they said, well, if we can sequence the spike protein, we can put it in RNA and make a vaccine. So I said that SARS outbreak was 2002, two, three. That were only the vaccine was only made, made available in 2007. By then, the SARS outbreak was way gone. But the point was, they discovered how to do it. Um, and then they said, well, if we ever have another SARS outbreak, what we need is the sequence of the spike protein. And it, this is like working at a bakery where you have this recipe for a very successful vanilla. So you can bake vanilla cakes. But somebody wants it for a Christian or a wedding party, and you put white icing on it. Somebody wants it for a baby review and you can either put blue or pink icing on it. And you can put flowers or mannequin or whatever. So whatever you need, you bake this one vanilla cake and you just decorate it a little bit different and you can sell it to everybody. Very successful. Now that's exactly the same with this COVID vaccine that they've been manufactured. So they said, listen, we know exactly how to manufacture it. We tested it. It's safe. All that we're going to do is change the icing. Once we change the icing, It'll work for whatever we have. We just need to know what you want it for. Baby reveal is the boy or girl, it's a wedding. Tell us and we'll give you the cake that you want. And that's what happened with the COVID vaccine. They know what to do. The moment they had the sequence, they could just start processing it. They had a vaccine that was already tested and safe. And 
of women. And that was for me, that's a remarkable success of science. The problem is, I think, communication. Of course, it was just swamped with all this nonsense on social media. Um, interestingly enough, with this, all this nonsense on social media, what they've dis detected now by analyzing the social media is, I think it's seven accounts that created all the conspiracy theories about COVID, and most of them emanated from this Robert Kennedy uh, was trying to run for American president uh, election later this year. Um, he, he's a huge conspiracy theorist, and he, he and his people following him actually created a huge amount of that that other people just amplified. Um, and that is actually our biggest problem, is, is how to keep the public informed uh, of, of this nonsense, whilst the science behind this is actually solid and fantastic and protective. Um, you know, and then people would say, but if I give a vaccine, you overwhelm the kids' immune system. I mean, so you, or the spike protein, contaminate your body with spike protein. I mean, so it's a couple of RNA molecules that will generate a couple of spike proteins that your immune system will recognize and create an antibody to so that you come in contact with a real virus and neutralize it. That's the one option. The other option is to get infected with COVID, which multiplies in your body, creates a lot of inflammation, billions of viruses, a huge amount of spike protein, which your body must try and handle. I mean, how do you want your immune system? It's like saying, listen, I want to teach my son what a BMW looks like. So I can either take him down to the garage, take off the wheels, take, put in uh, a new clean filter, change the oil, clean the car, and afterwards sit with a kid that I need to scrub for weeks to get rid of all the, the ground dust. Or I can show him a picture of a BMW's badge. And he will be able to walk around and say, oh, that's a BMW without all this other nonsense. Now, that's the same with vaccines. Like, I have to get the vaccine, and your immune system say, oh, this is what I was warned about, and I've got the antibody to deal with it. Or you can get the actual infection, where you will get immunity, but somebody else might be seriously ill, and somebody else might die for your immunity in just with an infection. And I think that's the, the context that we need to think about these things. But to come back. I think it's vaccines are, from a public health perspective, the most effective thing ever discovered. Not by epigenetics, but apparently by some Chinese guys or Turkish people. Uh, somewhere in the way, way back where none of us would ever find out who it was, but it works. And I like the point that you make um, on information in general. I think. We're in such an information age now, hence we have these puppy talks, for instance, where we have people who work with what we're talking about, um, and, you know, they partner with librarians, for instance, um, on, on seeing what is real and what is not real. I think one of the most critical things with information is to find out what is real, what is not real, because not all information is true. Um, okay, with that being said, I'm going to now open the floor, and I just like my... Um, my mic, Roma, to please assist me with this. He knows himself. He's going to come now and fetch my mic. <laughs> yeah, I've asked one of our own to assist um, Oh, sorry, just wait a second. Oh, that mic. Okay, no, you're going to fetch that mic and then, yeah, we'll, we'll get around of questions. Let's just check how much time do we have. Okay, we'll get around of two questions just to stick to time. And then uh, we'll direct your question to Dr. Kurta and we'll take it from there.
general vaccines as a whole. Uh, so, so this is the so-called side effects of vaccines. And I think we must be honest, there, there is no such a thing uh, without any side effects. I mean, whether it's paracetamol or this, but and you always weigh the benefits and uh, the support. To give you an example, um, COVID-19 is associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's about one in a million cases. So you need to give a million doses of uh, COVID vaccine and you might see one case of killing for it. Cardiac involvement with the COVID vaccine. So that's about, I think for every 25,000 doses of vaccine you give, mostly in young males, you will see a case of heart muscle involvement. The problem with that is, with COVID, it's about one in 50 that we'll see heart muscle involvement. The, the heart muscle involvement that you get from the COVID itself is significantly more severe than you get from the vaccine. Um, the problem is people latch onto this, here is the side effect, um, and therefore we're not going to take the vaccine, I'd rather get COVID itself, which is much worse. We've seen, and I haven't seen a single case of Guillain Barre from the COVID vaccine, although it's described in the literature. Um, I were involved with at least three cases of Guillain Barre of people who were infected with COVID and got Guillain Barre from that. You will all remember the, the, the plots with the, with the COVID vaccine. I mean, it's also one case per million. With the patients who got infected with COVID, especially those who ended up in ICU, plots were a major problem. We saw a lot of them. We had a lot of people, just uh, some of my colleagues, healthy, no other risk factors, had DVTs after their uh, COVID infection. So you understand that the, the point is there are these, these side effects, very rare, and significantly less severe than if you get the natural infection. So obviously it's a risk benefit ratio that you have to calculate. Um, if yellow fever has got severe side effects, but there's no yellow fever in South Africa, I'm not going to get vaccinated against yellow fever. But if I travel to Brasilia where there is yellow fever, well then I'd rather take the vaccine than run the risk of contracting it. So it's always this risk-benefit ratio that you have to calculate. But by large, the benefit from the vaccines far outweigh any risk. Please have our second question. Good morning. Um, so I just want to know what viruses like COVID um, and their high mutation rate, is it possible that vaccines can promote this mutation rate? Uh, so, so the question is, does vaccines promote the chains in the, in, in, uh, the genetic mutations in, in COVID or in any other, other virus for that matter? So no, it does not. So what, what happens is this these spontaneous mutation. So uh, how should I so let me give you this analogy. You remember uh, in the old days they transcribed the Bible in the monasteries. So that these mon uh, what is a what is a, a male nun. A monk. Oh, that's the word I'm looking for. They had these monks sitting there and they were transcribing the Bible. Very meticulous. Trying to make no mistakes. So that is how you would repl replicate human DNA. So the human DNA, the transcription of that is very meticulous and there's things that check for errors and correcting the errors. But say, downstairs in the monastery, there is a lot, a lot of these young monks that they have, they, with no experience and they just want to create a leaflet for a fair that they're holding. And they have to, to write these, these pamphlets. And uh, the telephone number for the monastery is 2013. But the head of the monastery's telephone number is 2018. And by chance, one of the guys looked at it and he thought that 3 was actually 8, so he makes it an 8. 
And then people discovered that actually that eight number, I get right to the head of the monastery, so I'll rather phone that and then everybody begins to make a pamphlet with that telephone number. Right. Now that is how meditations work. So it happens usually just by chance. Most of these viruses with mutation just die. Some of them, the mutation gives it a benefit against the wild type. So it's easy to infect a cell. It multiplies more quickly. It's more resistant if it's spread through air and the air dries out, it doesn't die. And because of that, by transmutation, it gets that added benefit. Now that virus starts to propagate. And that is how these mutations happen, and that's why the virus gets more infectious, multiplies faster, gets worse. Um, people think that the longer it carries on and it mutates, the more benign it becomes. But that is not true. What happens is, the more we are exposed to it, we develop antibodies, and the next time we get it, well, that's not exactly the same virus. Your immune system recognizes something of it so you don't get as severely ill. And that is why the disease becomes milder and milder. And you might not be aware, but there's a massive COVID, COVID outbreak going on at the moment. We've got nobody in hospital. Can't see any of you guys wearing masks. The only way we know that is because they're monitoring the sewage. So I think in Pamp Town, that's one of the places they have at the moment. So they, they take sewage water, they see how many COVID viruses there, and actually with the COVID outbreak those days, they could actually see that there's this many people, and there's that much COVID in the sewage, so they could, can actually calculate how many people have got COVID just by the number of viruses in sewage water. And we know from that there's a huge outbreak of COVID going on. Most of our immune system has seen it either by vaccination or natural infection. The only problem with natural infections is that a lot of people died of that. But our immune system is aware of So the virus is not milder, it's just our immune system are trained to recognize it. So that's the, so there's this whole concept of the virus becomes milder as it mutates. It's not true. If you have somebody that's completely an older person, who's never seen it before, they will get as ill as we had with the first one. Thank you so much for that. Oh, there's one more question. Two more questions. Okay, we're going to take the last round of two more questions. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Good uh, day, everyone. Dr. Kluter, I just want to know, uh, would it be come up with all the mutations and things, that we will have to have mass uh, vaccination again against COVID, or won't it in future be necessary again? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's an important thing, and everybody's worrying about that. So, so what we think at the moment is, remember who dies of COVID? It's mostly older people. So if the first time you're exposed to this um, and you're older, then you run the risk of dying. The death rate amongst children is negligible. So what is happening at the moment is everybody is immune apart from newborn babies. So, and this is this concept of the kids go to nursery school, they pick up all those viruses. But what they're actually doing is they bring it home and just tune your immune system again and expose you again. And by means of that, adults constantly update the immune system. Um, and although this, over, if you look 10 years ago, the virus now is completely different, but from year to year, every year you get exposed, and by means of that, you save. So we don't think it will ever be necessary again to vaccinate against this strain of COVID. Uh, remember, there's millions of different COVID viruses, so they monitoring and see whether there's again a jump from animals to humans, and then obviously then we'll vaccinate again. But with this COVID virus, unlikely to ever happen because we will be constantly exposed. And as I said, there's a massive outbreak in Cape Town at the moment. Nobody's worrying about that, and everybody there is getting exposed again and updating the antibodies. So. Uh, no, we don't think it will be ever necessary to, to vaccinate people. 
And if you want to get vaccinated, now somebody phoned me yesterday, it's impossible to get hold of any vaccine because nobody wants it and nobody's taking it, so nobody's keeping it. So there was one more question here in the front. Um, so, so you said that um, infections are caused by virus species or bacteria. Is there like any other cause besides those two that maybe hasn't been known? Sorry, like, what do you think? I, I missed that. Oh, infections are either viral or caused by viruses or bacteria species, right? So, I just wanted to know if maybe is there any research being done that like they can be caused by um, other things besides those two things? I don't agree. No, no, so, so remember, there is yeasts and there is archaea bacteria and there's protozoa and there's bacteria and there's viruses, there's everything and I suppose everything, anything that causes a disease in some form is something that will cause a disease. Yeah, no, so it's not only viruses and bacteria. But bacteria is the, is the most simple form, so it's easy to make a vaccine against it. The moment you get to bacteria, for instance, bacteria is a bit more complex, so it's more difficult. So we've got Prevanar, uh, there's some cholera vaccines, but not so much for bacteria. And then for malaria, they're trying to make a vaccine, that's much more difficult because that's not a, a bacteria anymore. So, yeah, no, but there's lots of other organisms causing diseases, um, but viruses is very easy to make a vaccine and that's why it's focused on that. All right, we've officially reached the end of our session. Um, and with, well, in closing, I'd like to say, Dr. Kruita, I think that I speak for everyone who is here in the audience that the, the very little knowledge that we had about vaccines has now been expanded greatly. Thank you so, so much. Um, and I really just want to say we really appreciate you. Thank you so, so much for taking your time to come here. Can we please give him a round of applause? <laughs> and on behalf of the library, we just have something small to say thank you so much because we'd never let you walk away without giving you something physically. So, <laughs> to remember us by. So I was wondering where the t-shirts are. So I did not bring a t-shirt. A library t-shirt. We're going to teach you something else. Um, <laughs> But it's just a token to say thank you so very much. Um, and very much. with that being said, um, also I forgot to add at the beginning of our talk that uh, Dr. Kruta has actually contributed to, I don't know, it's only seven articles, but I know there's probably more. Um, am I correct? It's, it's more than that. It's a lot. Okay. So <laughs> you can <laughs> go to our, our database. Um, we'll show you how to get there. And you can go through his articles. Um, He's contributed as well as many other people. And also in closing, I'd also like to encourage you to follow the UFS Library um, Instagram page. Our Instagram handle is UFS underscore library. You guys have cell phones, you guys are on social media, I know you are. So can you please follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, um, and we'll see you again at the next Toffee, Coffee Talk. I almost said Toffee Talk. Coffee Talk next month. Thank you so much. And audience, you guys should also give yourself a round of applause for being here. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.